All right, well, I'm going to do a quick two minute recap of the uh, kind of what we covered last month and then uh, move on to, into some additional comments. So we're tr doing our best to try to place Bibles, uh, the uh, dinosaurs within the biblical history. And uh, to do this, we have to really keep in mind that what we're trying to do is look at history through a different lens. I mean, you have your natural science trying to teach us a natural history of the world. Uh, how life came about through pretty natural processes and, you know, God was not involved in the, the, they have a, their own different interpretation of the fossil record. But we, we want to look at the world differently. We need to look at the world differently through the biblical lens, informed as we are by important events like the global flood. I mean, uh, geologists today have rejected that the global flood has been a real and historical event. They know about it. So I, I don't say that they're just misinterpreting the fossil record, they're reinterpreting the fossil record because historically, people when they looked at those fossils and rocks, they just assumed what they were looking at was the result of the global flood. I mean, it was a long-standing interpretation of that material. But modern geologists have uh, decided to argue against that and instead are claiming there was no global flood and those layers of rocks formed slowly and gradually over long periods of time. So we're having to kind of relook at Earth history. Well, if we're correct about this, about the global flood, then uh, one of the big questions we're going to ultimately get to is what happened to the dinosaurs. But let me review some important types real quick, because I'm going to be referring to some of these again later in historical records. There were the theropods, the big carnivorous dinosaurs with their three clawed fingers and toes, unquestionably one of the most terrifying animals to have ever walked the planet. Some of these reached 50 foot in length, had a skull that was six foot in length. These things could just pick you up and uh, swallow you whole. These are the sauropods. Their name means means lizard footed, so they're describing the different feet that they have. And this is how paleontologists thought they once, uh, once walked uh, up with their heads uh, uh, ver uh, uh, vertically aloft like this. And we'll see that this is now uh, um, was a, is an incorrect view on how these massive creatures would posture themselves, generally speaking. Now they view them as a, to have the head and the tail um, horizontally positioned with the tail raised off the ground as a counterbalance for those long necks. But they used to have them like this with the tails laying lazily along the ground. Then you had your ankylosaurs, big group of dinosaurs here, the often called the armadillos of the ancient world, uh, have those had this big protective scoots or plates along their back. And, and note that many of these had birds' beaks. The ankylosaurs had a bird-like beak. The stegosaurs, very recognizable dinosaur, also had, or like the, like the beaks on a turtle, similar kind of structure. And they had those plates on their back, the stegosaur did. The triceratops uh, had those big, that big horn, horned face is what the ceratops means. And they had that big, big frill or crest along, on, on their head as well. Then they had the hadrosaurs, which, uh, whose name means, mm, they were often called the duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, but their name means big lizard. These are as well were massive, massive creatures, full 30 feet long. And uh, even though I don't know if they, we don't really know what color these were, or so that colors weren't really well preserved, but we do find skin for many of these. A lot of soft tissue has been found for dinosaurs that has given some important insights into them and, and tells us that those creatures did not lo go extinct 65 million years ago because we have found lots and lots of soft tissue for these. But one of the questions we're trying to ask is what happened to the dinosaurs? Now today, modern paleontologists argue for a, a, a big climate shift as a result of an asteroid impact caused some severe climate shift and those dinosaurs weren't able to survive that. But if we're correct about Earth history, there was a major uh, catastrophe, not an asteroid catastrophe, but there was this global scale flood. and. Uh, and if we're correct, then the fossil record is, is a result of this global scale event. And, and I often ask the question when discussing this, what else would we expect to find if there was a global flood like the one described in the Bible, then what we actually find? We find the world is covered in hundreds of feet of flood sediments, laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals. I mean, that's exactly what you would expect to find if indeed there had been a global flood. And if that's true, then the fossil record has been grossly misinterpreted. They have significantly misinterpreted the world. But uh, it, so assuming this is true, then, then one thing is clear that the dinosaurs were alive at the time of the flood. 
they're a big part of the fossil record and the fossil record is the result of a global flood, then the dinosaurs were alive at the time of the flood and they were on board Noah's Ark because it specifically says two of every kind will come to you to be kept alive. So they were on board Noah's Ark. Then we're asking ultimately the question, what happened to them after the flood? What happened to them after the flood? And if, they, if it's true that we're on board the ark, they were reintroduced afterwards, then we, we should expect to find uh, evidence of this in his, historical accounts. And so that's the question we're, look, we're looking to answer. Are, is there evidence that humans have known about dinosaurs? Again, paleontologists are arguing for an interpretation of the fossil record that argues that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Long before humans are thought to evolve, the humans thought to evolve only with uh, less than two million years ago. You know, so the dinosaurs, according to their interpretation, were extinct 60 plus million years before humans ever walked the planet. But so we're asking the question then what ultimately happened to the dinosaurs. Now I've, I've, uh, I've already, already shown, just for a quick recap, that, uh, that if that we gotta know if we're, when we're looking at historical records that, uh, the, that the word, we don't expect to see the word dinosaurs in, the, in historical literatures, but we do, what we do see is the historical records referring to animals that, they, that have been collectively referred to as dragons. Uh, like this creature you see here. And, and in fact, the historical records of the ancient world are replete with accounts of dragons. Sightings of them were a great source of fear and even superstition. The men of, the men of old who killed them were renowned heroes and for many venerated saints. Nearly every country on the planet can be included in the list of those with, with uh, lengthy historical interactions with creatures similarly described as dragons or what we call today dinosaurs. So what, and I gave you some examples of that where dinosaurs were mentioned in the Bible. I don't want to go back into this, but uh, um, we saw that there was a creature called a Leviathan in the, in the fossil record, uh, or in the Bible, excuse me. Can you draw a Leviathan with a fish hook? It's described in the book of Job as a fire-breathing fire -breathing sea monster. Well, not just a sea monster. There are attributes that we believe will end it to be semi-aquatic, but there was a, a there was a, an animal that God, God describes in the book of Job that is without, un, in no uncertain terms, described as fire-breathing. It specifically states this in more than one phrase, that it actually breathed fire. As smoke billowed forth from its nostrils in these kind of terms. Well, we do produce flammable gases as a regular part of our digestive process, so there's no reason to uh, you know, there's no reason why this certainly could not be possible, that God could have fashioned an animal with such a, such a mechanism. And if I was to argue uh, for a creature that would have been Leviathan, it would have been this guy right here, Spinosaurus, which is unquestionably the most terrifying dinosaur that ever walked a planet. And this thing was just absolutely enormous. And we now know that they were semi-aquatic. This is a, a recent discoveries just over the last year or so have found that, the, that Spinosaurus was a semi-aquatic, unquatic predator able to swim. So fits well with the description in the book of Job of uh, the Leviathan. We also looked at Behemoth, another mm, dinosaur that, uh, that God is describing in the book of Job. But let me move on. There's also uh, cr uh, uh, creatures in the Bible described as fiery flying serpents. Uh, this one is mentioned in Isaiah that may be a pterosaur, like one of our big pterodactyls. While the term fiery has been argued to be a reference to their bite, they are mentioned here along with the viper, which is a venomous serpent, uh, distinguishing them from venomous snakes. And the term fiery may in fact be a reference to their bright and shiny appearance rather than their venomous bite. Interestingly, the same Hebrew word seraph is used for these creatures that is used in Isaiah chapter 6 to describe the heavenly creatures that fly around God's throne, the seraphim. It seems reasonable to uh, at least propose that, uh, the, the ser that these creatures were also bright and shiny like the seraphim described in the book of Job, these uh, fiery flying serpents that again are mentioned here in Isaiah. Countless ancient sources have referred to flying serpents, most notably Her the Greek historian Herodotus and uh, Flavius Josephus. Now Herodotus, a great, again a Greek historian, has been called the father of history, the father of the discipline of, uh, of uh, being a historian. He is called that because he was one of the first to uh, systematically collect and test uh, historical materials systematically and uh, 
tested them for accuracy. He noted these observations during the 5th century BC about winged serpents that he stated resembles animal, the animals called Hydra by the Greeks and uh, Latins. He says, there is a place in Arabia situated very near the city of Buto. I put, a, put that located on a map there for you. To which I went along hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. He continues, the form of the serpent is like that of a water snake, yet he has wings without feathers and is like as possible to the wings of a bat. Well, the only animal we know of that matches this description of membranous wings or non-feathered non cover wings are the pterosaurs. Herodotus goes on to describe their size, color, and coloration as being varied in colors, and uh, also describes their reproduction and some other attributes. He also tells us that these animals could sometimes be found in the Arabian spice groves, and stated that venomous flying serpents were infamous for living in frankincense trees. He says that when workers wanted to gather the tree's incense, the frankincense incense, they would uh, employ putrid smoke to drive away the uh, winged creatures. Other ancient sources uh, talk about the wings and head crest being of sparkling colors. Now this is an image from, from a paleontologist that shows what some of these weird head crests uh, look like, but the Herodotus refers to these head crests as well and, and, uh, as being sparkling colors. It could be that this shiny appear there was this shiny sparkling colors, uh, like a peacock's tail, the iridescent kind of colors. Think of that as as a as be what they would describe as fiery. Flavius Josephus was the first century Jewish historian and a, was a military leader who describes flying serpents that were numerous in certain areas and an interesting strategy used by Moses when leading the Egyptian army against Nubia. He states that Moses was able to advance on the Nubians stealthily by taking his army through lands overrun by these flying serpents, using tamed birds called ibis to, that would attack and clear the serpents in advance of his army. That they would carry these birds with them in cages, release these birds from these cages, they would fly ahead of them, drive out these, these serpents, these flying serpents, so that the armies could progress through. <coughs> He says this, Moses invented a wonderful stratagem to preserve the army safe and without hurt. For he made baskets like unto arks of sedge and filled them with ibis, that bird, and carried them along with them. Which animals is the greatest enemy to the serpents imaginable? For they fly from them when they come near them, and as they fly they are caught and devoured by them, as if it were done by the hearts. Excuse me, but the ibis are tamed creatures and only and the and only enemies to the serpentine kind. As soon, therefore, as Moses was come to the land which was the breeders of these serpents, he let loose the ibis and by their means repelled the serpentine kind and used them for his assistance before the army came upon that ground. <coughs> Excuse me. It also is noteworthy that Herodotus attributes the uh, bones. He mentions, um, <coughs> excuse me, bones, of the flying serpents he saw in Arabia to Ibis attacking them during their annual migration through a narrow gorge, and says they are the same kind as the serpents that invade Egypt. Pliny the Elder also mentions the use of the Ibis by the Egyptians against the incursions of these kinds of winged serpents. So this is good historical back background to these animals and the use of ibis to attack them. Well, fiery serpents are also mentioned in Numbers 21 when the Israelites became impatient with Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. God then sent fiery serpents to attack the people. Note here in, uh, that are in Numbers 21. Make a, uh, uh, so. Now, although it is not mentioned that the serpents were flying, 
It says that they were sent, and the snakes, uh, snakes are not generally ranging or migratory in this way, that they could be sent upon a people, uh, nor do they normally travel in companies or in numbers. They are not built to traverse significant distances at all, in fact. Yet the language implies that they were dwelling elsewhere and were directed by God into the Israelite encampment. The verse that I mentioned here, you, if you remember this account from Numbers, because of the attack of these uh, serpents, Moses set up a, uh, made a, uh, a bronze pole with a serpent on it. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people died. And the Lord said to Moses, make your fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and, er and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Well, in 2 Kings, it is said that Hezekiah destroyed that bronze serpent that Moses made because the people of Israel had begun worshiping it as a god that they called Nehushtan. It is furthermore argued by many theologians that the bronze serpent was not just an ordinary snake in appearance. I mean, who would worship, uh, you know, a snake, a regular snake that was stuck on a pole? In fact, historians or theologians throughout the centuries have generally regarded the Nehushtan serpent that Moses had placed on a pole as being a winged serpent. Note these illustrations from the 12th, 15th, and 19th century that show Nehushtan, that uh, bronze serpent that most had, most had placed on a pole, it has been customarily regarded by theologians through the centuries as being a winged serpent. Note this one, this is again from the 19th century, it shows Nehushta up on a pole, and you can see other winged serpents there flying around, and a couple scurrying along the ground with wings. Very interesting. Well, as recently as the early 1900s, early uh, elderly folk in Clay Morgan in Wales described a colony of winged serpents that formerly lived in the woods around Penland Castle. Note the description of their appearance as being brightly colored and shiny, like the fiery serpents we saw described in the, in the Bible. An elderly inhabitant of Penland said that in his boyhood, the winged serpents were described as very beautiful. They were coiled when in repose and looked as if they were covered with jewels of all sorts. Some of them had crests sparkling with all the colors of the rainbow. When disturbed, they glided swiftly, sparkling all over to their hiding places. When angry, they flew over people's heads with outspread wings, bright and sometimes with eyes, too, like the feathers in a peacock's tail. He said it was no old story invented to frighten children, but a real fact. His fathers and uncles had, had, had killed some of them, for they were as bad as foxes uh, for poultry. The old men attributed the extinction of the winged serpents to the fact that they were terrors in the farmlands and coverts. Well, dragons are found throughout the literature of antiquity, and many of the best-known heroes of old were dragon slayers. Beowulf, for example, was a legendary heroic dragon slayer during the 6th century, whose feats are memorialized in an epic Old English Anglo-Saxon Anglo story. As the story goes, Beowulf traveled to assist the Danish king Hrothgar, for whom his father was in service. Hrothgar's great hall, called Herot, was being plagued by a dinosaur who had attacked the, the Danes for 12 years with impunity. At the request of the king, Beowulf comes with the 14 warriors to assist in the destruction of the monster. He, is, uh, he first kills several sea reptiles, it's, it is said, then the Grindel that was attacking the hall, and uh, ultimately lost his life uh, from wounds he received fly, uh, fighting a flying dragon that some argue may have been a pterosaur. Well, although the events have been held to be fictitious in the Beowulf epic, the people and the dating of it are historically accurate. In fact, grave mounds have been found for a number of people mentioned in the Beowulf epic. And in fact, Beowulf's own grave mound was discovered in 1950 in uh, Sweden. This is Beowulf's grave mound. It was the largest grave mound of any of those discovered in this area. Beowulf was a real hero. 
a real person, a real hero. If there's anything fictitious in this, uh, I don't know. According, it's all historically accurate, except for the dragon part, according to some. But recent excavations in Denmark, where the Scandinavian tradition located the Skylding family, the royal family of Danes, uh, have, have, have revealed that a hall, in fact, like Harold, was built in the 6th century, exactly in the time period of Beowulf. Three halls were discovered about 50 meters long each during excavations. The majority of scholars now view the people in the epic story, such as Hrothgar, the king, and the Skyling family as having been based on real people in the 6th century Scandinavia. Was it fictitious or historical account? The Wawel dragon is a famous dragon from the 8th century Poland account, also known as the Gra dragon of Krakow. According to the legend, it lived in a cave under Wawel Hill in the 8th century. The dragon is said to have eaten nearby cattle, and after many attempts to kill it, the beast was ultimately poisoned by stuffing a ram with sulfur. The hero, a man named Krakus, later became the monarch or namesake of the city and is credited for building Walwal Castle on the hill above the cave where the dragon had laired. Today, a statue is on the shore of the river there near the cave that breathes fire periodically or when you send a text message to a particular code, you can send a text message to get the thing to breathe fire for you. The cave where the dragon is said to have laired is a popular tourist attraction. You can see the cave there with the lit floor. The nearby Walwal Cathedral displays bones hanging outside the main entrance that are rumored to have come from the, from the dragon's lair, the cave. And then there's a plaque on the wall, outside the wall of the cathedral. The translation of it reads this, Krakus, a Polish prince ruled from 730 to 750 AD. Here is the cave in which having killed the wild dragon, he settled at Wawa and found the city of Krakow. Now, these don't look like mythological records to me in any way whatsoever, but this is historical stuff. But because paleontologists have decided that the fossil record should be interpreted thusly, and dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, we're told to just ignore all of this. From all over the world, throughout history, we find historical evidence that dinosaurs or dragons were known to humans. In 330 BC, after Alexander the Great invaded India, he brought back reports of a great hissing dragon living in a cave which the people were worshiping as a god. Later Greek ruler, rulers supposedly brought dragons back from, alive from Ethiopia. In a floor mosaic located in an artificial cave in Palestrina, Italy, that, that dates to the 100 BC, the exotic fauna of the Nile is illustrated. The animals are all named. I, if I blew, I blew this up, you can see that there's names above all of these animals. Lots of animals can be found in the mosaic, but one stands out that does not seem to belong based on our, our thinking about the kinds of animals that were alive at this point in time, based on paleontologist assertions. I'll blow it up for you here, and this is what you see. The animal's being hunted, and it's an animal with four legs, a long tail, a long neck, and what looks very much like a beak, rather than uh, teeth jaws. The only animals known to have those specific characteristics are the ornithischian dinosaurs, some of those ornithischian dinosaurs. In the Dionysus mosaic that was discovered on the floor of a private home in Zippori in northern Israel and dates to, the, to 300 AD, there's a scene there depicting an animal being hunted as well, which I will enlarge. One hunter has a spear, another is throwing a large rock at the creature, and the animal is clearly a reptile but with the tail raised off the ground, a crest on its back, horns on its head, looking very similar to a dinosaur. Angkor Wat, shown here, was built in the early 12th century as a Hindu temple, now Buddhist. It is spread across 400 acres and is said to be the largest religious monument in the world. Its name means Temple City. Well, on a stone pillar within the temple, <clears throat> was found this carving that almost everyone immediately recognizes to be a stegosaur. Now, the common criticism
criticism or claim to explain away these things that we have found, people that have done drawings or mosaics or cave carvings or these kind of things, is that ancient peoples had just f found fossils and deduced what they look like the same way we have. However, our paleontologists went through some very painstaking efforts to uh, determine uh, the, the morphology, the shape of much of these, and for them the stegosaurs was particularly problematic. And that's because the plates on the stegosaur back are not attached to their skeletal system. They are dermal plates, the scutes, they're, they're just attached to the skin, to the dermis. And early paleontologists had them laying flat on the back, like the scutes of an ankylosaur. Even we got the placement of those plates wrong, and it's very doubt because again they don't attach to the to the skeleton. It's very very doubtful that uh, that ancient peoples would have uh, been able to deduce how those animals actually looked. Marco Polo traveled throughout Asia, Persia, China, and Indonesia in between 1271 and 1291 A.D. and recorded his journey in, the, in a work titled "The Travels of Marco Polo." In chapter 49, he describes the dragons found in the providence named Karajan. He says this, Here are found snakes and huge serpents, ten paces in length and ten spans in girth. That's 30 feet long. At the forepart near the head, they have two short legs having three claws like those of a tiger with eyes larger than a penny loaf and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Well, those sound very much like a theropod dinosaur to me. The small legs in the front with three clawed, uh, you know, fingers and toes. He also goes on to explain how the people of the area killed them with spike traps they embedded in the ground uh, on the trails made by the creature and records that they were killed because their flesh was an esteemed delicacy and their gallbladder was harvested for medicinal purposes. Although Marco Polo has been criticized for claiming to see such creatures in Asia, the stegosaur carving on an Angkor Wat in Cambodia in the, in the 12th century, very near this uh, record, adds strong credibility to the existence of dinosaurs in Asia during this period of time. Richard Bell was a bishop of Carlisle, Cumbria, that's in northwest England, near, uh, and who died in the year 1496 and was buried in a tomb in this cathedral called Carlisle Cathedral. His tomb is inlaid with brass engravings that show Bell with his, uh, with his vestments, his bishop cap and his hook staff, and, and also contain the brass engravings are a number of animals. Next to uh, various other animals, there's a fish and a dog and a weasel and a bird and a pig and, and others, are these two creatures that the tomb designer clearly intended to be taken as literally as the others. Portrayed are two animals seemingly engaged in a struggle. The animal on the right has a long neck, a long tail, looking much like a seropod dinosaur. But interestingly, as I pointed out earlier, the necks and tails are positioned horizontally, but early paleontologists until recently uh, believed that the seropods held their necks vertically aloft, somewhat like a giraffe does, and the tail was thought to lie lazily along the ground where they kind of dragged it along. They are now recognized to have the neck and the tail positioned horizontally just as the brass engraving shows. This painting is titled The Suicide of Saul. This was created by Peter Bruegel the Elder in 1562. It depicts an epic battle between Israel and the Philistines on Mount Gilboa that is recorded in 1 Samuel 31, uh, during which Saul's sons were killed and Saul fell on his sword for fear of being uh, mistreated uh, when captured. You can see Saul positioned right here, having fallen on his sword. But the, the, the image on the scene that I want to point out to you is way back over in here where there is a, uh, a number of uh, troops advancing forward. I'm going to blow this up to you so you can see what people have noted. There are two animals that are being ridden that look very much like seropod dinosaurs. However, it is argued that the animals are just meant to be camels, and I, I meant I consider this to be possible. 
There in, in the picture uh, in the same vicinity, there are people riding horses. There's one right here riding a horse through water. And the artist may well have been wanting to uh, make it very clear that this was not a horse by drawing a neck that was a little more elongated than would be normal. However, um, when considered that this is the exact same time period of Richard Bell's tomb, that the, it, it, it tends to add a little credibility to the, at least the possibility that dinosaurs of that type were known during this period of time. An extensive knowledge and worship of dinosaurs is also evident in Mesoamerica and South America, lasting for centuries. The Akambaro figurines were discovered in 1945 near Akambaro, Guanajuato, Mexico, by a collector of pre-Columbian ceramics and by the name of uh, Jules Rudd. After in their initial discovery, he managed to amass more than 30,000 of the figurines over a five to six year period of time by offering one peso each for any that were found. The, st the statuettes <coughs> were of humans, but also monsters were found in dozens of easily recognizable dinosaurs, like the ankylosaur that you see here, and uh, uh, also people together with dinosaurs. Now, in 1953, the Mexican government sent archaeologists from the National Institute of Anthropology and History uh, to investigate. They set up a dig site about a mile from the original discovery location of the, of the figurines, and they also found figurines, including dinosaurs. They concluded that the figurines did, did correspond to a pre-classic civilization of the uh, Chipoquaro and could date to as early as 800 BC, but not the dinosaur figurines. Um, because uh, obviously they couldn't possibly be anything but modern reproductions or be as human interaction with dinosaurs was impossible. And that remains their view to this day, and they have refused any other dig permits to archaeologists since the 1950s. Now, it is quite possible when you offer one peso each that, you know, people have started making these up to bring to this guy. For some of these, I can't myself just say with absolute certainty these are real, you know, and ancient. But when you look at, the, you know, all around the world, I think the case is just too overwhelming to deny. Thousands of burial stones, over 11,000 in fact, were excavated in Ica, Peru, beginning as early as the 16th century, that contained a library of Im images, many of which archaeologists believe ancient man would have no knowledge of, such as med medical practices and uh, dinosaurs, such as the ceratops shown here. The images were apparently created by pre in pre-Columbian times and buried in graves alongside Native American mummies. The earliest known European reports of the artifacts are from a, a Spanish priest and Jesuit missionary by the name of Father Simon in 1535. Samples were sent back to Spain in 1562. This is long before the existence of dinosaurs were discovered. The word dinosaur wasn't even coined until the mid-1800s. And you have, definitely have figurines of dinosaurs that were discovered in Ica, Peru, predating the modern knowledge of dinosaurs. The Temple of the Feathered Serpent, as it's known, uh, is shown here, and it dominates the Teotihuacan pre-Columbian archaeological site in central Mexico. The structure is notable partly due to the discovery in the 1980s of more than 100 sacrificial victims found buried beneath the structure. They were sacrificing people at this temple. Who were they sacrificing them to? Their dragon god, referred to as the feather and serpent. Let me blow that up for you so you can take a look at what, the, what this thing looked like. This was their god that they worshiped. Note that the, it has a, a crest of feathers about its head, a characteristic of, of some of the theropod dinosaurs that, that paleontologists have only recently identified. The Temple of Kukulkan is a Mesoamerican step pyramid that dominates the center of the Chichen Itza archaeological site in the Mexican state of Yucatan. It is built by a pre-Columbian Mayan civilization sometime between the 9th and 12th centuries. The pyramid served as a temple of their god Kukulkan, shown here at the foot of the pyramid. Kukulkan was a dragon god, closely related to the god of the Aztecs, called Quetzalcoatl. 
Interestingly, the largest known flying animal of, of all times was a pterosaur that lived in North America, which stood about 10 feet tall at the shoulders and had a wingspan as large as 50 foot. This enormous pterosaur was given the scientific name Quetzalcoatlus, after Quetzalcoatl, the dragon god of the Aztecs. Now, I'm not saying this is what Quetzalcoatl looked like by any means, but the naming of it again shows that it is widely recognized that these ancient creatures possess the characteristics ascribed to dragons of old. Evidence of dinosaurs in North America has also been found. This is a reproduction of a petroglyph, a rock art, that was originally discovered in 1879 in the Havasupai Canyon in Arizona. In 1924, a scientific expedition was sent to the, can the canyon to document the artifacts and petroglyphs left behind by Native Americans and document their existence. There is a very heavy desert varnish on this petroglyph, which verifies its antiquity and thus its authenticity, it would seem. The varnish on this petroglyph is just as thick as the other petroglyphs, which are known to be authentic. This one is questioned, though, however, because it seems to be depicting a dinosaur. The director in, of the 1924 exhibition, expedition, Samuel Hubbard, said the following about the above petroglyph. He said, the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. Facts are stubborn. <coughs> and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, then the theories must change, the facts remain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please consider that our modern knowledge of what dinosaurs look like is again less than 100, uh, less than 200 years old, and this petroglyph was made long before the modern discovery and reconstruction of dinosaurs. The only way people could have made an accurate drawing of this creature is that they had seen them alive. In addition, remember that the, this discovery was made in 1879. That's only 37 years after the word dinosaur was even coined. Well, a couple of other biblical references can be used to illustrate that uh, just as there were many types of dinosaurs, there were also many types of dragons known uh, to uh, people of antiquity by different names. We have different names for dinosaurs. They had different names for dragons. For example, the ba basilisk, and the cockatrice. You can see the basilisk referred to here in uh, the Psalms 91 in the Catholic Bible. The cockatrice is uh, mentioned in Isaiah 14, and this is the King James Version, along with the fiery flying serpent mentioned previously. Now these names can be found in literature throughout antiquity as well that describe dragons, like natural history books. Every natural history book before the 1800s contained early scientific descriptions and depictions of dragons. The cockatrice was described here in the Mundus Subterraneus, a 12-volume World Digest published in 1665. The cockatrice was described as having two legs, with, uh, two, uh, long, uh, it was a two-legged reptile with feathered plumage and a long scaled, scale-covered tail. Well, we know dinosaurs look like, we had many dinosaurs that look like this. This one in particular is, uh, this is the, the name of this particular dinosaur. It's called an ornithomimosaur, which means bird mimicking lizard. It had the exact characteristics uh, that were just as described as a cockatrice. The Cosmographia was an early ge geography book and one of the most successful and popular books of the 16th century, seen 24 editions. Along with its many maps, it included uh, descriptions of flora and fauna from around the world, and uh, including dragons. The basilisk is shown here, was a dragon of antiquity, whose name comes from the Greek word basilikos, which means little king. The little king term is a, a reference to the crown-like structure that was on its head. Let's look at the rest of the characteristics. It had big plates or scoots along on his back, a long tail, and we know that there were dinosaurs that looked like this. Notice the ankylosaur had what very much appears like a crown-like structure on its head, a bird's-like beak, same kind of plates on its back, and a long tail. In 1723, the Natural History of Switzerland published an account of a shepherd seeing a dragon in central Switzerland along 
with the, uh, now, although the animal might seem very fanciful or unrealistic, keep in mind that the engraver likely had no direct contact with the shepherd to verify the accuracy of the rendering, but was basing it on exclusively on the physical description that was provided. Nevertheless, let's examine it for essential characteristics. It had three clawed fingers and three clawed toes. It had a long neck, a long tail, a crown-like structure on its head. And look at this thing. This is a Dilophosaurus. Many of the theropod dinosaurs had a crown-like structure on their head, and then, of course, they all had three clawed fingers and toes. And now before criticizing that poor shepherd, consider how long you would have stood there and made a you know, good mental note of that creature that you could pass along to, uh, you know, to the, what kind of description would you have given to that creature? You've been out there with your sheep, you know, and you saw it come across, come across that thing, you'd have been running for the next 30 minutes, you know, <laughs> five second glance, maybe, and then running. Well, we, I've seen several uh, drawings that had a face that looked kind of like a face of a lion, and I probably attributed to the fact that it was described as having teeth like a lion. I mean, either were described having claws like a lion or teeth like a lion. You see those kind of descriptions. They either had a beak or they had uh, teeth like, you know, like a lion, if that's the only, you know. So, and if, you, if a person is drawing that creature and it was told that it had teeth like a lion, you're going to draw a mouth that kind of looks like a lion. I think it just tends to reason. Numerous booklets were published as, uh, as public service announcements when a dragon was sighted, and, and uh, that would include information about its physical characteristics and how it was killed. This booklet was published in 1614 in the Sussex County of England, describing encounters near the village that became known as Dragon's Green. It contains speculations about the reproduction and even supernatural abilities, along with descriptions of a dragon slain in a neighboring county and numerous references to even more ancient sources about dragons. I won't uh, read this one for sake of time, but in 1669, this book it was published about a flying serpent that was killed in Essex County, England. Here's the synopsis that you're going to read through there if you want. Today, Hinnom is a small village that is best known for the dragon that was killed there, which is still proudly displayed on their town sign. Hmm. Well, one of the questions we're trying to answer is what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, again, since dinosaurs are found in the fossil record, what we're really trying to answer is what happened to those that survived the flood. Well, almost exclusively the counts of dragons that we find in throughout history uh, are of them being killed or of them tr people trying to kill them. Um, the heroes responsible are, are mentioned and the methods that are used are often described when they, were, when they killed these creatures. Humans appear to have been responsible, which is not really surprising we, why we're you know, but they, we want to get, answer the question, why, were, why would humans be killing these animals? Well, maybe they tasted like chicken, you know? A little, a little bit of sriracha, you know, some uh, buffalo wings, you know, it'd be pretty good. But seriously, uh, the dinosaurs were, without question, the most terrifying animals that ever roamed the planet. And we will instinctively kill any animal that we find, af that we are afraid of. I, when I lived in Oklahoma, I had a neighbor, my, when my neighbor uh, come, and t come to get me to uh, get a, get a t snake that was in her yard to kill it. She didn't want me just getting rid of the snake. She wanted that snake dead. And she wasn't happy that I walked off with it and turned it loose out in the pasture behind my house. She wanted that thing dead. When you find something threatening, you know, when we're afraid of something, we want to, we want to kill them. Uh, frequently, the accounts speak of them killing uh, uh, sheep or goats or those and we kill animals for those reasons as well. The Tasmanian tiger, if you've never heard of them, was a marsupial dog that we hunted to extinction. A lobbying group was formed called the Buckman Tiger and Eagle Extermination Society that was formed to lobby the government to have those animals hunted to extinction because they were killing sheep and chickens and things. That's what we do. If we find them threatening, either uh, potentially threatening or they're actually threatening to our livelihood, um, they were also monstrous creatures. We will kill them for trophy or sport. You know, you get a big bear rug and throw it on your floor or put you a big, you know, uh, 
swordfish up on your wall or whatever. We kill animals just for a trophy or a sport as well. But there's another reason why these were likely killed, and that is uh, because of superstition. Or maybe that's not a good word for it, superstition. But the Bible describes Satan on several occasions as a dragon or a serpent, such as uh, the one that was in the Garden of Eden or in Revelation. Now, remember, not, not a, it wasn't a legless serpent. Remember, there's a serpent in antiquity was a reptile with a long neck and a long tail. Snakes were described as legless serpents. So whatever that creature was in the Garden of Eden is probably not a snake. But I, I picture it to be one of those big theropods, you know, big uh, T-Rex over there tempting to eat. Hey, Eve, you know. <laughs> That'd be a pretty influential animal, you know what I mean? Think about that. How influential would a great big 50-foot long theropod be to come up and talk to you? You know, we should not be surprised. I mean, it's not the only animal that talks in the Bible. We shouldn't be surprised. But I'm um, here from Revelation 12. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angel waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there is no, was no place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is a 14th century painting that shows the archangel Michael defeating a dragon, a scene inspired from Revelation 12. This is a, a relief is on the Gurk Cathedral in Austria from uh, 1180 A.D. that shows the lion, a lion the, uh, representing Christ, killing a dragon. This is clearly a basilisk. I mean, it's a biz and the big fanciful dragons we're used to seeing. Look, it's got it's four, it's a quadruped, four on the ground with four legs, has what clearly look like big plates or scoots along his back, and a distinctive bird beak just like the ankylosaur that we've seen previously. St. George is the patron saint of England, is shown here fighting uh, the dragon that he was sainted for. This is when Raphael's painting for 1905. But Saint, although St. George is the most famous saint for killing a dragon, he's not the only one. I mean, uh, you could, but you could find St. George cathedral, th cathedrals practically in every country in the world, or at least those were colonial countries from England, but you can find St. George cathedrals all over the place. There was one in, it, there was a, I don't remember exactly where we saw it, but there, there was one in Israel. There was a big uh, St. George uh, statue that we saw someplace in Israel. I have a picture of it. I need to remember where it was because, you know, sometimes when you get back, you're like, uh, yeah, I know. Fortunately, our phones uh, stamp stuff this day, so that's going to be good. But I create, this is a short list that I was able to create pretty quickly of people that were sainted for killing dragons. A whole bunch of people were sainted by the Catholic Church for killing dragons, um, including uh, uh, Martha of Bethany, who was uh, involved with killing a Tarrasque, uh, an animal that was called a Tarrasque. You can still find Tarrasque in Corpus Christi processions today. You go online and look for a, uh, do a search for Tarrasque, and you'll find the models of Tarrasque that are being used in some of these parades today. Martha of Bethany, um, where's another? St. Romanus was involved with a similar incident, the believed to be a, a, a dragon called a goji or a gargoyle that is thought to be the, the, uh, the, the, the source of the term gargoyle. They mounted the head of the thing on top of the church after killing it, which led to the practice of uh, putting those statues or carvings up there that are typically dragons. But there's a huge list. By, by the way, Martha of Bethany, this was Lazarus' sister, who we know traveled to France as a missionary and died there. But uh, interestingly, there you find there's a... These are, not, these are not the kind of things that myths inspire. These are historical accounts. Now, you have asked the Catholic Church about it today, and I guarantee you because, you know, they, they've accepted natural science, they would deny all of this. But they did not just willy-nilly pass out sainthood. They would send a contingent of people to investigate the event and make sure there was, that this that had actually happened before they venerated someone to sainthood you know, this is not, these are not the kinds of things that we in, inspire, inspire myths. These are historical records. So the mystery of what happened in the dinosaurs really only due to the false assertions of natural science. 
that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, before humans evolved. This is one of the myths spoken about in 2 Timothy, which is refuted by literally a mountain of historical records of human encounters with these creatures from all over the world. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. These dragons were not mythological. Sure, fishermen's stories happen, you know what I mean? They get bigger and, you know, but these are the, as a, as a, there's just too many. They were the dinosaurs. These accounts were definitely the dinosaurs that survived the flood and were later killed by humans. Now, why is this important? Do we really care what happened to the dinosaurs? No. I mean, it really, you know, we want to have an accurate his, uh, knowledge of history, and, and, uh, but they illustrate that there's a significant problem with their interpretation of the fossil record. The, the, well, if you look at the world, there's the historical records from all over the world that show that people knew about an, these kind of animals. And yet paleontologists say these things went extinct 60 plus million years before people ever walked the planet. It illustrates that there's a significant problem with their interpretation of the fossil record. And the reason why that's a problem is because of what the fossil record is, what it means. And we know that the, God, we know why God destroyed the world by flood, but I, I've said it, likely said it before. I mean, many of God's judgments back in uh, in the Old Testament were the, brought by plagues, brought by plagues. And you want to kill off a bunch of people, you bring a plague. Plagues are often very species specific. You can just kill just the people. Not the animals, not the plants. You just wipe out the people, you know? Could have had old Noah and his family move off to some distant area, wipe them all out with the plague, and then come on back. Not kill the animals, not, kill, not destroyed the world as it was at that point in time. The world was destroyed. We will never really know what the world was like before the flood because it was so irreversibly and irreparably altered. All, there was likely water underneath all of the continents a body of fresh water underneath all the land masses is how that, that is viewed. And that fresh water is what came out, flooded the earth, and then recessed back into oceans. So the earth was irreparably destroyed. The water cycle, how the, the whole system of how the earth was watered. And if you look at it in the beginning, it says earth, water came up out of the ground and watered the whole surface of the, surface of the ground in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. This is how it says the world was watered. But so why did he choose a flood this time and destroyed the world the way he did? I think he did it because if it had been a plague, who would know? Who would know today? What evidence could we point to that God's judgment, a significant judgment had come in the past if it was a plague? What would we have to point to? He wanted to make sure we would never forget, leave an everlasting memorial to remind us just how much he hates sin. The God that we serve has a tremendous hatred of sin. We have a built-in sense of wrong. He says his law is written upon our heart. We have a built-in sense of right and wrong. We know his laws. We know what he views to be right and wrong. It's built in. We do things that we know are wrong. And he knows, and this is, a, this is something that God detests, detests on this level, that he was willing to destroy the entire world by flood. All the plants, all the animals, everything died. And he doesn't want us to forget. So he left an everlasting memorial of that flood to help us remember just how much God hates sin. And when paleontologists re change that, when they reinterpret the fossil record, arguing that, no, there was no global flood. Those are layers of rocks formed slowly and gradual over long periods of time, the way sediments form today. There was no global flood. That removed, destroyed in a way, God's memorial to remind us just to, about that terrible judgment on that day. And that's a, ter that's a terrible thing because we need to be reminded how much God hates sin. The church doesn't remind us much anymore. The church has kind of changed the nature of God. They focus a lot on his loving character and don't talk a lot about sin. You find few pastors today talk about sin makes people uncomfortable and they don't come back. But Repent, seeing of sin is the central message of the Bible. That's what the prophets preach. That's what John the Baptist preached. That's what Jesus preached. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the central message of the Bible. 
don't live with sin. We all sin, we all make a mistake, but you then you have to ask forgiveness and stop. You got to repent. Repent is the single man, it's the big deal. And he doesn't want us to forget. And I'd argue that the God that we serve not only hate is not only does he still hate sin this much, but he hates it even more. Because we live at a time after Jesus died, after God sent his son and died for us. Who do you think he's, he would hate sin in the life of more? Someone let live back in Noah's day before, before he sent his son or someone that lives now? In the, in, in the life of someone that knows his son died for them in that horrible, horrible way and then continues to live in sin? I guarantee he hates sin more in our life now, the people that know this, than he did back then. And we should not forget, that's how much he hates sin. He hates sin that much. He destroyed the whole world by flood. What's he going to do to us? Those that have live knowing that his son died for us in that horrible, horrible way. But, and remember, Jesus re reminded us that just as, the, as, as suddenly as the judgment came in Noah's day, it will come upon us. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. But just like he gave Noah and his family a way to be saved from the judgment that was to come upon them, so he's given us a way to be saved from the judgment that will befall us. That's to accept the, the payment of sin, that, to accept his son, Jesus, the payment of sin that he has provided for us, and to repent. But you must repent. It's, it's not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. You, there's a lot of theologians today teach uh, uh, what, what R.C. Sproul and some are called easy believism, or what Bonhoeffer called uh, cheap grace. You know, that all you have to do is say that one little prayer at some point, ask Jesus in your heart, and that's it. You can continue to live any way you want. The church kind of teaches this. Teaches this. It's the kind of church I grew up in. That all you have to do is say that one little prayer, and that's it. But repentance is the, sing, is the, is the big deal. You can't... We all make a mistake. You will sin. It happens. But it's when you live in sin, when you live in sin, that you have separated yourself from God. He will distance himself from you, won't hear your prayers, and you will go to hell if you live in sin, regardless of what prayer you said a long time ago. You got to repent. That's the, that's the message. Let me close down a prayer. Father God, we thank you that we, uh, that, that you, <clears throat> that we have your word, Lord, that gives us such a tremendous insight in this world, Father God, and we help, we ask for help, Lord, to, uh, to be a witness for you, Father. <sighs> help us to be bold in our witness, in our testimony. Help us to be bold, Father, remembering that the world is lost, that everyone that we see when we're at the store, when we're driving down the roads, that everyone is lost. They have no a clue of where they live. They have no clue who they are. They don't understand that you made this world, and they believe they're just an evolved animal. Father God, they are truly lost, Father God, and uh, help us to be bold. Help us to step out in front of them and prevent them from driving off the cliff that they're heading towards, cliff to, cliff to immortal damnation. Father God, help us to be bold in our witness to remember that we are in possession of a great truth, of a truth that can save these people from everlasting torment. Help us to be bold, Father God. We ask for boldness, Father God. Help us to be bold that we have a great truth, that we know this is the truth, and that they have, they have accepted a terrible lie, a terrible lie concocted by the father of lies who took the form of that serpent that, and lies, lies, lies. Father God, help us to be bold, Father. Give us wisdom and insight to help us understand the arguments that are being used today to counter your word, Father God, and to be bold in our testimony and our witness. Help us to speak it to everyone that we see because they know that you are God. They know it. They've accepted a lie, but they know it inside that there is a God. 
Help us, Lord, to speak it. When we see people at the store, when we see they're having trouble, help us to be bold and speak the words of truth that we have, Father God. Help us to be bold, Father. Praise you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your word that's given us a tr tremendous insight. Lord, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, who has died for us. Wretched sinners. Wretched as we are. Wretched, wretched sinners. That you've died for us, Father God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, my Father. Praise you, my God. Be with us this week, Father, and help us to be bold in our testimony, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.